Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar in Landscape Ecology Working Party in UFLO. This is a third webinar of our webinar series. Today's topic is forest in Fukushima and Chernobyl, people, wildlife, and landscape. My name is Toshia Matsura, Regional Coordinator of Japan and Oceania in Landscape Ecology Working Party. I'm belonging in Forestry and Forest Product Research Institute, Japan. This year is the 30th anniversary of our working party. I'm hosting today's webinar with Shoji Hashimoto. He's the chair coordinator of the working party of radioactive contamination of forest ecosystem in UFLO. First of all, I'll briefly explain about UFLO by sharing a few slides. Okay, so UFLO is an international union of forest research organization, a global non-profit, non-governmental and non-discriminatory scientific organization founded in 1892 and the headquarters located in Vienna, Australia. UFLO is open to all individuals and organizations dedicated to research related to forest and forest products. UFLO's mission is to advance, advance research and knowledge sharing and foster sustainable development of forest-based solutions to benefit forests and people worldwide. Research teams include various aspects of forests, such as people, climate change, forest-based products for green future, biodiversity, extreme services, biological in invasions, interaction among forest, soil, and water. Under the headquarters, there are divisions, that is kind of research groups and task forces, special projects, programs, and initiatives. You can see details in the homepage. There are nine permanent divisions covering widely key forest research field. Our working party belongs to division eight, forest environment. Our landscape ecology working party is under the unit of forest ecosystem functions. The chief coordinator is Juan Azevedo, Portugal, with two deputies of Pele Fan, United States, and Jose, Jose Gobi, Argentina. There are several regional coordinators, including me, and two thematic coordinators, and also regional representatives worldwide. The radioactive contamination forest system working party is under the unit of impacts of air pollution and climate change on forest ecosystems and started from 2014. The chief coordinator is Shoji Hashimoto Japan, who is the moderator of today's webinar. Mike Wood, United Kingdom, one of the working party deputies, is also joining today's webinar as a panelist, particularly pre presenting on Chernobyl. Our latest meeting for each working party was in Curitiba, Brazil, in 2019, during the last World Congress in UFLO. The Landscape Ecology Working Party has been very active in these 30 years in organizing and promoting events, publications, and participation in initiatives of several types. The next meeting will be in this year, or maybe in the next year. The date and location are still be to be decided. We also have the webinar series starting from last year. The radioactive contamination of first existing working party had an interdisciplinary session in the last Congress on radioactive contamination of forest 
learning lessons from Chernobyl and Fukushima spotlighted in UFLOW. So today's webinar is a joint webinar with these two working parties. Today, moderator is Shoji Hashimoto, Forestry and Forest Product Research Institute and Associate Professor at the University of Tokyo, Japan. Today, we have three panelists from Japan and the United, United Kingdom on topics of forests in Fukushima and Chernobyl, people, wildlife, and landscape. Today, we have more than or almost 190 legislations from more than 50 countries or territories worldwide. Thank you for joining our webinar. So let's start the webinar. So time is yours. Thank you, Toshia. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar today. My name is Shoji Hashimoto. I am the coordinator of Radio Ecology Unit of uh, the U International Union of Forest Research Organizations. Uh, I'd like to moderate today's webinar. As Toshia mentioned, this webinar is a joint webinar of landscape ecology and rad radio ecology units. So as you can guess, this webinar is about landscape and nuclear disaster. But I myself think that the topics in the webinar are even wider because radioactive contaminations affect everything in the contaminated areas, including forests, people's life, ecosystems, landscape, and so on. So this webinar is not about radioecology, Rather, the topics are transdisciplinary. The aim of this webinar is to look at uh, two nuclear disasters from different angles and viewpoints. The landscape is a very good scale to do this. First, I'm going to talk about the overall background. Let me share my screen. forests in Fukushima and Chernobyl, people, wildlife, and landscape. Do you remember the spring of 1986? I was around 10 and in Japan. I vaguely remember that time as my parents were discussing something bad news with a newspaper in their hand. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident happened in April. 1986. So this spring is the 35th anniversary of the Chernobyl accident. Coincidentally, 25 years later, again, a nuclear accident happened in a spring in Japan. It's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident. So we Japanese had many memorial events last month. The chaos of 10 years ago is still fresh in Japanese people's minds. Chernobyl and Fukushima are the two worst nuclear accidents in human nuclear history. Many kinds of radionuclides were released by the accidents. What you see here is estimated amounts of released radionuclides in the Chernobyl and Fukushima nuclear power plant accidents. The point is that various radionuclides that have different half-life were released. That means some radionuclides decay very quickly, days to years time scale, but others have decades time scale and even longer than 1,000 years time scales. And another point is that the two accidents are rated as the worst events in history 
but the amount of released radionuclides is larger in Chernobyl than in Fukushima. Let's look at the geographical scale. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant is located at the north of Ukraine, and Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is located at the northeast Japan, about 200 kilometer north of Tokyo Metropolitan. Let's have a look at the geographical scale of the contamination. What you see here is the distribution of radiocesium, which is a major radionuclide released by the accidents. Please note the scale is different between the two maps. As you may know, the Chernobyl accident widely contaminated the whole European continent. And the Fukushima accident contaminated the northeastern areas of Japanese archipelago. The next maps show the distributions and density of forests in European continent and the Fukushima area. As you see, in these contaminated areas, forest is a key ecosystem. I don't go into details about dynamics of radionuclides in forest ecosystems, but I'd like to share two points. The first is that radionuclides remain within forest. First, radionuclides are trapped by trees and then migrate to soil. So most radionuclides are in soil. Another point is that it is a small portion, but radionuclides continue circulating within forest ecosystems as a material nutrient cycles in forests. This is driven by biogeochemical cycles in forest ecosystems. This is not only about tree and soil, but all components in forests like mushrooms, wildlife, everything. If you stand at the top of a hill in Fukushima, you can enjoy this kind of beautiful landscape. This is an example of a landscape in Fukushima, so-called Satoyama landscape in Japanese. As you can see, the landscape is composed of forests, small arable land, and the people. These components interact with each other in the long history, and the interactions develop this kind of ecosystem and landscape. The same is true for areas around Chernobyl. Finally, this is a framework of impacts of radioactive contamination. When you hear the word nuclear accident, what do you think of? I guess it's the radiation dose effect. Yes, it's correct. Too much radiation is harmful to not only humans, but also all living things in the landscape. But another huge impact is caused by the countermeasures to pro protect humans from radiation dose. They are like side effects. One thing is the restricted use and the consumption of forest products. Imagine life in mountainous villages, local people live on forest products. Another thing is removal, removal of people from some areas and depopulation. Because as you saw in the previous slide, the ecosystem and the landscape are formed by the interactions and the balances between nature and humans. These indirect impacts change people's life, ecosystem, and the landscape. These two maps show the exclusion zone in Chernobyl and Fukushima. In these areas, basically, people are not allowed to live and enter. This is an extreme example of sudden removal of people from the landscape. So today we have three talks. The first talk is about land cover change by Dr. Takeo Tadono of Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. 
he's going to talk about the land cover change detected from the space. Second talk is by Professor Haruka Fujiwara of Fukushima University. She is going to talk about local people, what happened and are happening to local people in Fukushima. The last talk is by Professor Mike Wood in Salford University, UK. The first two talks are mainly about Fukushima, but Mike notes both Fukushima and Chernobyl. His talk is about wildlife, but he will also talk about communication and education. To avoid any network trouble, we use recorded videos for the three talks. But after the three talks, we will have live question time and live panel discussion. Please send us your questions and comments anytime using a Google form. This link will be shown in the chat box. Okay, let's start the first talk. I will share the videos. Hello everyone. My name is Takeo Tazono, who is working in the Aerospace Exploration Research Center, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. Thanks for giving this opportunity to introduce our activity today. I'm a manager of the Aerospace Exploration Satellite called AEROS, and I usually working on calibration and validation of the satellite data and development of the algorithm for scientific and practical purposes. One of my research interested in forest and ecosystems monitoring based on the satellite data. That technique is called remote sensing. This is the outline of my talk. I think many audiences may not be familiar with remote sensing. Therefore, I will briefly explain it as the introduction. The main contents of my talk is show the land cover changes. So. Then I will explain how to create a land cover map using Earth observation survey data. And where a case study of the Chernobyl is also introduced. Then the temporal changes of the land cover in Fukushima Prefecture, Japan, will be shown to see recovery state from the Great Earthquake 2011. Finally, I will conclude my talk. First of all, what is a remote sensing? That is uh, the technique of the observation without touching the targets uh, which are interested in anything by users. For example, if we are now interested in to the forest ecosystem and the landscape, we have to consider how to obtain related information remotely. To achieve these objectives, uh, if we use the data and imagery, from the sensors uh, that are mounted on the satellite, it is called house of observation. There are various types of sensors exist, which can detect different electromagnetic waves. This upper figure shows an example of the reflection properties in natural objects. The x-axis shows the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave and Y axis is reflection intensity. For example, this region called Bisbran infrared and the microwave is allocated in a longer wavelength over centimeters. The individual natural objectives has typical reflection properties. For example, green color shows it for the vegetation. And each sensor has different observable band that is sensitive to different reflection properties to estimate the target condition using this information. This is principle of remote sensing. Uh, this is an example of the uh, optical imagery, uh, which can be shown similar color composite with human eyes. Therefore, easy to understand the target condition. However, it is affected by color. Uh, this is an example of the synthetic aperture radar or star imagery that is not used sunlight, so can observe even in the night time and uh, but weather condition. 
Next, I will briefly explain how to create a round cover map, which is information extraction from the uh, satellite data. At the advantage of the, uh, using the satellite remote sensing, it has capable observation re repeatability and con combining usage with other satellite data visually. There are so many methods uh, that exist in the land cover class classification, but in general, they are categorized into two types, unsupervised classification and uh, supervised classification. Uh, in JAXA, uh, we are currently using the two supervised classification to create a round cover map. I'm not going to in detail, but one of the methods called SACRAS and another is uh, the convolution neural network based method. I would like to introduce a similar purpose of the published research in Chernobyl, Ukraine. Uh, this was analyzed the vegetation dynamics impact by the nuclear disaster in 1986. Uh, figure 1 shows the location of the Chernobyl power plant. Uh, the red line shows the boundary of the 30 km exclusion zone. Uh, figure 2 indicates that the land cover classification used the U.S. MODIS instrument in 2018, and th this is an enlarged version of the selected categories. And figure 3 explains the temporal changes of the uh, individual land cover area ratio. As you see, um, some land cover types are increasing. For example, evergreen and need leaf forest, but the other are decreasing. Uh, for example, decidual broadleaf uh, forest with the savanna and so on. This is an example of the analysis of the land cover change during a long time. Uh, next, I would like to introduce the land cover map uh, the data set in Japan, uh, which have been created by JAXA. Uh, we have released the LC map for three periods so far. The first version of the LC map in Japan was mainly used Avenue 2 optical data on board of the uh, Advanced Land Observing Satellite, or AEROS, uh, which has 10 meter special resolution and 10 categories. It was used data acquired before the earthquake, though it is indicated as before here. The second one was mainly used U.S. Landsat 8 data acquired from 2014 to 2016, which is indicated as five years later from the earthquake. It has a 30 meter resolution and 10 categories. The third one was mainly used European Sentinel-2 data acquired from 2018 to 2020, so it indicated as a approximately 10 years later. It has 10 meter resolution and 12 categories. And this figure shows the uh, 10 years later of the land cover map in Japan. The color is corresponding to the categories indicated here. Uh, Fukushima Prefecture is around here. Uh, next, I will focus on the more detail in Fukushima. Uh, this figure shows the land cover map before the earthquake in the entire Fukushima Prefecture, Japan. Uh, each color corresponding to the, uh, this region and this uh, red mark uh, shows the location of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant or LDNRPP. Characteristically, the red pixels indicate the urban area, the blue are uh, large parties, and yellow uh, grassland and greenish uh, four color pixels indicate four types of the forest. Uh, but sometimes these forests are misclassified. Uh, this figure shows the uh, five years uh, later uh, from the earthquake, the same view as uh, on the previous slide. Uh, comparing with the uh, before earthquake data on the previous uh, page, slide, uh, we can see the uh, uh, Pacific coastal area, especially uh, near 
uh, FDNPP has changed gradually from rice paddy to the uh, grassland. Uh, this is probably due to the damage caused by the tsunami that followed the earthquake, as well as the exclusion zone imposed by the nuclear action as introduced by Shoji-san before. Uh, this figure shows the uh, map 10 years later. Uh, there are uh, not many significant changes compared to five years later, but uh, there uh, seems to be an in, uh, increase in the number of the urban area as red pixels in grassland as yellow pixel near the coastal area. In the next few slides, the following four areas indicated from number one to number three uh, enlarged to show the characteristics land cover changes. This is area number one of the enlarged map near uh, Namiya town, Futaba district, Fukushima, or as near FDNPP. Uh, from right, left to right, there are the map before earthquake five years later and ten years later, respe respectively. Um, and the color assigned with the same as the previous slide. Uh, this area is near FD and PP. Therefore, almost all rice parties have been changed to the grassland in five years later. And it looks like a shrink of the urban area in Namia downtown and uh, coastal re residence. Then, the expansion of the urban area near FD and PP feature due to the construction of the temporal waste storage in 10 years later. And a new solar uh, plant and the recovery downtown area uh, could be seen from the uh, map. Unfortunately, I couldn't find significant changes in the forest region, but it may necessarily carefully inspect in detail. This is area number two of the enlarged map near Minami Soma city, Fukushima. The southern part of that is close to the FDNPP, so many parties change to the grassland and some part to the cropland. Uh, this area was uh, seriously damaged by tsunami after the earthquake, therefore uh, bare land of the coastal area was uh, slightly expanded in the five years later. Then, uh, we can see many uh, parties uh, recovered and uh, several new solar power uh, plants are constructed in 10 years later. Um, finally, uh, this is area number three of the enlarged map near uh, Soma City, Fukushima. Uh, this inland water sea is called Matsukawa Ura. Uh, which is a uh, natural park and uh, covered by forest along the uh, sea before earthquake. But it, but it was affected by tsunami and the world changed to bear land in five years now. Uh, some part looks and the recovery constructions and a new uh, solar plant is also developed in 10 years later. Um, in summary, I introduced an example of the uh, reconstruction uh, and the recovery of the uh, Tohoku Fukushima region on the occasion of the Great Earthquake uh, in 2011. Uh, based on the temporal change of the land cover maps created from the Earth Observation Satellite data, um, Earth Observation Satellite, uh, the only way of the preserved wide area uh, condition at that time and that moment. Uh, to make uh, use of the emergency data is not uh, enough without the priority situation. Uh, that is also acquired by the uh, satellite remote sensing. Uh, also, unfortunately, radiation levels cannot be measured directly by satellite. Uh, their impact on ecosystems, including uh, satellite reefs and landscape ecology. Uh, uh, can be seen through the uh, land cover changes. 
Uh, this related topics will be presented in detail by Haruka in the next presentation. And uh, this is a kind of the long-term issues, and uh, it is important that we continue to monitor these changes in near future. In JAXA, uh, this is uh, LOC's mission that can observe the land region precisely. Uh, currently, LOC2 with SAR instrument is operating well, and the LOC3 optical mission is planned to be launched in this Japanese physical year. And the LOC4 follows the mission of the LOC2 will be uh, launched in Jap next Japanese physical year, 2022. Uh, this will be contributed to observe the land cover and the ecosystems continuously in the near future. Uh, that's all I have today. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, the so next is about to uh, local people. Hello, everyone. I am Haruka Fujiwara. It's my first time to participate at IUFRO, and it's a pleasure to join this webinar and this class with you all. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm a professor at Fukushima University, Faculty of Economics Business. My main field of research is environment economics. Recently, I'm working on two topics. First, public expenditure of Fukushima's nuclear disaster reconstruction. Second, damage and recovery of Satoyama life. Today's topic covers the latter. Today, I would like to talk about two topics, damage to rural lifestyle in mountainous communities called Abukuma. Also, I want to point out the problems of compensation from TEVCO and the government financial measurement. And I would like to discuss the future perspectives. Before talking about damage, I will describe to you what Fukushima, uh, what Satoyama life is in Abukuma. I guess most of you are unfamiliar with this term. Satoyama is a Japanese term it indicates countryside mosaic landscape of different ecosystem types, secondary forests, farmlands, grassland, and irrigation ponds, along with rural settlements. It is also known as social ecological production landscapes. Satoyama landscapes produce much of the food and fuel wood, timber, and water for local communities. Satoyama life is a way of life with interaction between human and natural systems. The Abukuma Mountains is a region between Abukuma River, which flows north through the center of Fukushima Prefecture, and the Pacific Ocean. It is highest altitude is about 1,000 uh, 1, meters. Rolling hills and forests extend 100 70 kilometers along the coast, offering residents a Satoyama life. Many large bald reef forests remain in Abukuma. Particular Nyakoji in the center of Abukuma has reminded a large area of broad leaf forests through human activities. Kokas Selata and Caucasus axisma planted in secondary forests are key elements of Satoyama landscape. In the past, they were there, these were mainly used for firewood and charcoal. After charcoal fell out of use, these trees were mainly grown to use as a bedrock to cultivate sitak mushrooms. Abukuma above our Miyakoji village was one of Japan's major production municipalities for shiitake logs in terms of quality and quantity. A characteristic provision service in Satoyama of secondary forest 
is the supply of important library food resources. Broadleaf forests serve not only timber products, but also non-timber products, which are wild plant animals and products harvested from forests. These products or resources support human livelihood. Local people call the second forest the treasure in their lives. Abundant natural resources and easy access to them could make people self-efficient in food and energy and water. The forests are very close to their houses. In the forest, they use resources and land to cultivate it. These natural resources are essential for local people. Through human nature interaction over a long time, knowledge and practice are locally developed. In recent years, urbanization has threatened this lifestyle that depends on natural resources, and it has changed the way in, of inheriting traditions and adjusting the new era. While the population of the village has, was declining, some people who are interested in environmental issue and aim for environmental friendly lifestyle have migrated to the village. Fukushima nuclear disaster has co caused radioactive contamination and damage to land, industry, and life in Abukuma. Miyakoji village is located within 20 to 30 kilometers of Fukushima Daiichi power plant. Since much of cesium 134's half life has passed, the radiation in the air has decreased significantly. Now, the rate in Miyakoji village is from 0 0.2 to 0 0.5. Although cesium 134's half life is short, two years, that of cesium. 137 is quite long, 30 years. Recently, co-researchers measured the contamination of mountain soil in Miyakoji. The maximum was around 10,000 becquerel kilogram. If we simply calculate, the soil will be reach 100 becquerel kilogram only after 200 years. As you know, radiation will not only affect the present generation, but also future generation. 50,000 cubic meter, meter of logs for shiitake were produced in Fukushima, which was the third highest in Japan. However, after the disaster, production sharply decreased. The Japanese government made the radiation limit for shiitake 50 becquerel kilogram. Shiitake logs produced in Miyakoji village mostly exceeds this level, not only in Miyakoji, but as other prefectures around Fukushima, the shipment of shiitake logs has been restricted. The situation is the same for wild mushroom, plants, animals, and honey. They are mostly more radioactive than the limit for foods. Miyakoji village was facing depopulation, a low birth rate, and an aging, aging population before Fukushima's nuclear disaster, but these accelerated. Also, as it rapidly progressed, more fields were abandoned, and there were a shortage of farmers a rapid increase of wildlife, especially wild boar, is making farming difficult because of less hunting and people moving from uninhabitable evacuation zone. For the damage itself, recovering from the damage, TEPCO has been compensating people and the government has taken financial measures, but there are some problems TEFCO recognized as damage only business activities with receipts and or contracts. The Japanese government made a reconstruction policy for the forest, developing new industries such as Udi Biomass Power Plant 
to maintain forests and use logs for the power generation instead of shiitake. But the measure has some problems. The scale of power generation plants is too large. They require more wood than available, potentially threatening the region's forest. Moreover, since the ash from the generation will concentrate radioactivities, some local people have initiated a lawsuit. The most important point of this problem common to both is there is no compensation or government measure to recover livelihood in Abukuma. Because of contaminated forest, the human nature interaction in Abukuma were broken. In particular, maintaining secondary forest resources tend to be high contaminated. And many resources are not available like they used to be. Since the secondary forest is contaminated and will be difficult to use for a long time, some people, communities who own forests have started selling soil and sand in hills and mountains as the materials for covering decontaminated land and for construction coast, coastal embankments. Considering all problems, all these problems, my suggestion to recover livelihood is better planning land use on Satoyama. The plan should cover not only for secondary forests, but also farmland, grassland, along with rural settlements, as I describe as Satoyama. To create plans, there are four important points. A first, focus on the covering livelihood, aiming for sustainable lives. Along, as long as pollution of nature continues, it will be difficult to make economic profit in short time. Looking back at the past, the important point is not short-term economic gain, but protecting secondary forests and Satoyama landscapes as property or legacy of ancestor and recovering lifestyle, which depend on which natural resources. Landscape of Satoyama and depending on the resources brings happiness to residents. And it's also one of the reason for returning the village. Second, make the plan with a long-term perspective we must consider along the ashes of time radioactive trees, future generations. We need to find a way to revive a Satoyama lifestyle with minimum radio exposure. To do so, we must first measure radioactivity and make a detailed contaminated map. Separate land use according to the radiation level High contaminated mountains should be maintained in a way that encourages natural renewal without human too much intervention. Instead, turn abandoned farmland in poor condition into secondary forest. Farm, farmland with good condition will be used for vegetable rice and cult cultivation we also have to think about and has the landscape, diversity, wildlife habitat to enrich the life of current and future generation, integrate to the various ecosystem service upon which human livelihood depends. Diversity can also be enhanced by wise and sustainable use of land and resources. Third, create plants in each village with participation of residents. Land use method vary depending on land condition, population, tradition, and culture. 
not only owner of secondary forest land, but also all residents of village need to think about how to live in the area and how to use the land based on that. Fourth, create a bottom-up model of leaf construction and sustainable life and encourage policy change. The construction plans were often decided from the top down. Listen to the voice of the local people, present a bottom up approach to reconstruction and seek the compensation and financial measures necessary to achieve this. Lastly, I'd like to introduce an organization active in Miyakoji village that I helped found it and belong as ad advisor. The name is Abukuma Sustainable Life Institute in English. It was founded one year ago. The goal is to create Satoyama landscape that will be handed down to the future in 150 years when the cesium-137 will be reduced to 3%. The group is made up of members of residents, chiefs of local forestry office, and researchers like me, as me. We are about to go into full swing. At this time, we are planning creating, creating a land use plan for Satoyama with several village and support activities related to that plan. Thanks for listening. Any questions and comments are welcome. Okay, the next, the last talk is by Mike. It's about uh, wildlife. I will share the screen. Hi, I'm Mike Wood, Professor of Applied Ecology at the University of Salford in the UK. I've spent the last two decades researching radioactivity and its impacts on wildlife. And over this time, I've worked with national regulators, the European Commission, United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency, to embed my science and the science of my collaborators into the system of radiation protection that we use for protecting the environment and also to develop associated policy and guidance documentation. Chernobyl and Fukushima both provide us with natural laboratories which we can use to study the response of wildlife and ecosystems to radiation and to the abandonment by people. The majority of my work over the last eight years has been within the Chernobyl exclusion zone. So that will be the primary focus of this presentation. However, I've also worked in Fukushima and collaborate with many others who study wildlife of the abandoned region there. So I'll draw on some of those studies as well to put the forests and wildlife of both of these abandoned landscapes into context. I mentioned policy and regulation. This highlights why we need to get the science right. The major international organisations that establish the international system for radiological protection have and continue to draw on our science to develop that international system. Countries around the world use the outputs from those organisations to develop regulations and to develop policy. The models, the software tools that we've developed to support implementation of environmental radiation protection are used for making regulatory decisions for a vast array of applications. And this includes things like regulation of cancer treatment hospitals, research facilities, nuclear power stations, nuclear legacy decommissioning activities. Based on a recent survey, the ERICA tool that we initially developed in mid 2000s and has been updated based on new findings from studies in places like Chernobyl and Fukushima 
is now the most widely used environmental radiological assessment tool globally. It's used in 70% of all countries with operational nuclear power stations, including the top six nuclear power producers. It's important that science gives us a solid foundation for such regulation. And fundamental to that is international consensus on the extent to which radiation impacts on wildlife. However, as these two headlines from the BBC illustrate, such consensus is lacking. In fact, the extent to which radiation impacts on the environment is the most significant scientific controversy in radioecology research internationally. Here I'm going to reflect on the overall weight of evidence and what that tells us regarding the wildlife in the forests of Chernobyl and Fukushima. In Chernobyl, we've used diverse technologies to study the forests and wildlife of abandoned areas. For example, we've deployed motion activated wildlife cameras to study large mammals, acoustic recorders to study birds and other wildlife based on their vocalizations. We've also used drones to study forest growth. And this has been coupled with the use of what we might class as simpler technologies. For example, you can see here a blanket drag being used to study ectoparasites. And we've also undertaken small mammal trapping to study the small mammal populations. So what about forest cover in the abandoned areas? Well, where previously there was a significant human influence on the management of the landscape, especially for agricultural and timber production purposes, the 1986 Chernobyl accident led to the sudden and sustained abandonment of areas. Previously heavily managed forests have reverted to a more natural state. We see succession in previously agricultural land which has resulted in extensive expansion of forest areas within the zone. And many of the rural villages are disappearing into the forest. Such changes aren't restricted to the rural villages though. Pripyat, the town of approximately 50,000 residents that was located closest to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant has changed markedly in the 30 years since abandonment. The roads, sports stadium, main square, and many of the buildings now have trees growing through them. The area is rapidly being reclaimed by the expanding forest. Along the narrow western plume of contamination from the accident, the area known as the Red Forest in which the pine trees died following exposure to the radioactive plume in 1986 has subsequently regenerated as a deciduous forest despite the high radiation levels that remain. Deciduous trees are more resistant to radiation than pine trees. Similarly, in the areas abandoned following the Fukushima accident, increases in natural vegetation cover following abandonment of agricultural lands and urban areas have also been observed. What about the wildlife? Well, although we rarely encounter large mammals when working in Chernobyl, we regularly see these wild Chevalsky's horses. They were introduced into the zone in the 1990s and their population has increased substantially. Our wildlife cameras have revealed an amazing diversity of wildlife within the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Perhaps the most exciting was our ability to provide the first confirmed evidence of the return of brown bear to the Chernobyl area. We've also observed that the diversity of large mammals isn't skewed by radiation level. We see the same diversity of wildlife in both high and low contamination areas. Our studies on small mammals have detected some associations between total radiation dose and things like the gut microbial community of these animals. But overall, we find that the small mammal populations are abundant across all radiation levels. The diversity of wildlife that we observe in Chernobyl's abandoned areas is impressive. 
and so too is the rate of increase in the large mammal populations that's occurred since the time of the accident. For example, some of our colleagues have published data from a large um, set of surveys undertaken in the Belarusian abandoned area to the north of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Since the accident, there's been very significant increases in the densities of large mammals, including elk, roe deer and wild boar. The latter, the wild boar, that you see declining in that figure that's shown on this slide, are likely declining due to a combination of both increased predation by the high numbers of wolves that are present and also a outbreak of swine fever which has affected the wild boar populations within the zone. Our colleague Dr Jim Beasley from the University of Georgia has been undertaking studies in the Fukushima exclusion zone and has also observed increasing large mammal activity within the abandoned areas. Now explaining to people about wildlife research in these abandoned areas is often challenging. Many people struggle to picture what the areas are like. Often the classical images of grey crumbling buildings of Pripyat dominate perception. Coupled with popularised myths such as the notion of radioactive mutant animals, it can become challenging to explain the reality of wildlife changes after people have left these areas. We've therefore created Virtual Chernobyl, which is a virtual reality experience that allows people to explore the abandoned areas for themselves. I've used this for education in Ukraine and in the UK. I've used it for supporting dialogue with local communities in the area around the Chernobyl exclusion zone, and also in discussions with regulators and government officials around the world, including in Ukraine, Japan, and Thailand. You'll see there a web link to virtualchernobyl.com. You can use this web link to take a look at a short preview video of Virtual Chernobyl for yourself. There's now a significant focus on the future management of abandoned areas in Ukraine and Japan. In Ukraine, we've been working with communities and government officials to implement plans to return some of the abandoned lands to local communities. We've also been working with the recently created Chernobyl Biosphere Reserve in planning future management of the ecosystems and wildlife. There are of course challenges to be managed here as well. For example, the potentially competing pressures of tourism and wildlife conservation. But through open dialogue amongst key stakeholders, it seems likely that these competing pressures can be managed for the benefit of all. I've given you a very brief overview of the work that we've undertaken in Chernobyl and also put this in the context of Fukushima. Our research and the development of virtual Chernobyl have significantly helped to change public opinion on the impacts of the Chernobyl accident on wildlife and resulted in us receiving the highly prestigious Times Higher Education Award for research. It's a bit like the Oscars of higher education in the UK, so it really was a great honour to receive this. So what are the key messages that I'd like you to take away from this presentation? Well, firstly, vegetation succession in abandoned areas has led to significant forest expansion in Chernobyl. And similar vegetation succession has been observed in abandoned areas of Fukushima. Although high levels of radiation in some of these abandoned areas may result in impacts on wildlife, the dominant influence is the removal of people. In the absence of humans, forests and their wildlife seem to do surprisingly well in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. Many thanks for listening.
Okay. Uh, let's move on to the question time. We have 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, Takeo, Helka, Mike, and Toshia, please turn on your camera and unmute your microphone, please. Okay. Thank you very much for your insightful presentations and uh, prepar preparing the videos. Uh, uh, the first question is to Takeo. Uh, okay, uh, we have we received many questions. Uh, first question is uh, technical question. What sensors have you used for land use, land cover change studies? Please, Takeo. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, in, during my presentation, uh, uh, we uh, uh, mainly used the, the March temporal optical imagery and uh, also the uh, March temporal cell imagery as sub uh, auxiliary data. So both optical and radar are used in here, this uh, classification. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question is uh, also to Takeo, a technical question. And the, it's uh, what, what is uh, overall accuracy for land cover maps? Uh, where and in what criteria are validation points set? Uh, well, uh, it would, uh, yeah, uh, much uh, the technical. Uh, point of view, but actually uh, we have been corrected uh, uh, validation point manually uh, from the wider area and entire the Japan. Uh, it, it was about uh, uh, 2,700 in total. Uh, using this validation point, uh, we uh, evaluate our classification map. Uh, and uh, well, some statistical well, calculation uh, conducted to calculate overall accuracy. It's caring about the user's accuracy as, and also the producer's, producer's accuracy. So I just uh, mentioned in slide, it, uh, it is overall accuracy. But uh, sorry, <laughs> I have no time to uh, explain more detail about that. Okay, thank you. The next question is to Haruka. Uh, did, okay, how, how many people was removed from the uh, exclusion zone in Fukushima? Well, at present, the population of the no-go area is about uh, 24,000. Okay, that, that means 24,000 people were removed uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I okay. mean, yes, I mean, totally, and it's it's no go area, so no. Uh, 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 I couldn't count the whole uh, the evacuation people, so uh, it's hard it's hard to uh, calculate it. But um, I can say no in the no go area is about twenty four thousand people are evacuating. Okay, thank you. The next question is uh, a bit long. Hi, thank you for your talk. I, uh, to Helga, sorry. Hi, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed your talk and uh, liked uh, your call for sustainable policies and a 150 year plan that encompasses the uh, ex system needs, needs of how deciduous forests. I was wondering if there is a special law or government schemes to support forest land ownership and management in Fukushima. For example, forests to provide vital ecosystem services and enhance the half-life cycle uh, of airborne radioactive isotopes. They could be mortised and land tenure could be increased, increased to encourage Cross generation, generational management. Please. Okay. 
Uh, thanks for an uh, important question. Um, well, such law or government stem does not exist in Japan yet, uh, but we need to demand the government for laws and systems to manage mountains in in the long term and bio biodiversity friendly manner. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is to Mike. Uh, how how is wildlife population management control done in Chernobyl zone? So in reality, there, there isn't really an awful lot of direct management of wildlife populations within the zone. The only real control that I'm aware of as such is in relation to the dogs um, in and around Chernobyl town where there's a charity that organizes vets to, to sterilize dogs and to to help manage the, the population size of those dogs. Um, the rest of the wildlife is largely self-managed. So, you know, whilst obviously things like management of the forest areas within the zone, management of the water resources will have an influence on the wildlife that are present there, there isn't direct control and management really taking place on the wildlife at any kind of significant scale. Okay, thank you. And the... Uh... Next question is also to Mike. When when did the tourism start in Chernobyl? What enabled it? So the, the, the tourism in Chernobyl, as far as I know, started in the sort of around about 2005, 2008 period. Certainly I think that the first major registration of a tour operator was 2008. And obviously in the initial stages, that was, was, was very much disaster tourism. Um, people wanting to go and see this place that they'd heard about in the news. I mean, Shoji, in your, in your introduction, you said about being 10 years old and, and thinking back to that time of, of hearing this, I was very much the similar age. And again, I heard about this on the news and, and always wondered what the place was really like. So I think that that was undoubtedly an early driver for tourism activity. Since then, there has been increasing awareness of, of Chernobyl. Um, there were things like the HBO series on Chernobyl, which had a massive international profile and dramatically increased tourism numbers again. And, you know, over the time of me visiting, it's gone from turning up at checkpoint and there being not really anything there to turning up at a checkpoint and there being a kiosk there that's serving refreshments and souvenirs, information boards around all over the place. It's, it's changed dramatically. And I think as, as we move forward and as the biosphere reserves operation continues to develop, I foresee increasing interest in the ecotourism angle as well. So I suspect that tourism in, in Chernobyl is set to continue into the future. Okay, and the uh, next question is to Haruka. Uh, okay, yeah, this is uh, this question is from uh, uh, maybe student in 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 studying in Japan. Uh, I I I I lived in it. Itate uh, to do my field work in 2017. One thing I remember clearly is a uh, mountain being chopped by government to get sand to cover the decontaminated farmlands. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that forested land owners in Abukuma regions are selling soil and sand for coastal reconstruction, etc. Can you say more, more on this? For example, what is the scale and how long has that been occurring? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for, for uh, the uh, question. Well, um, I, don't, I don't know the whole scale, but uh, it's happened uh, many uh, municipalities. But uh, in, in Miyakoji village case, uh, that's a uh, uh, it uh, it it's about uh, thirty nine hecta 
hectare, hmm? uh, hectare, and also it's 24, uh, 20, uh, 12 locations are uh, mining the soil. So, and then uh, actually, um, I, I, uh, I, I felt the same as uh, the, uh, the, 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 the should the students uh, who gave me this question. Um, that's the reason why I started active in Miyakoji village. I wanted to stop the mining or sharing the soil. Uh, I feel so sorry for the uh, mountain. So yeah, that's the answer, yeah. Thank you. And the uh, next question is also to Mike. What has been the major driver for the return of mammals and the for and the forest in Chernobyl? Well, un undoubtedly, the major driver is is the removal of people and the removal of, of land management by people in many of the different areas. Um, whilst you you still have a central area within the Chernobyl exclusion zone, which is the the technical area where a lot of work is is ongoing with the management of the remains of, of the reactor complex. There are huge areas surrounding this, which are abandoned areas and there is very little human activity within there. So unsurprisingly, when you take human activity out of those areas and human disturbance out of those areas, they become habitats that larger mammals can move into securely without fear of, of, of persecution by people. Okay, thank you. I, I think uh, it's, uh, thank you very much for many questions, uh, but uh, it's time to move on to the panel discussion. Uh, okay, and uh, there are a lot of topics I want to discuss. Okay, first I'd like to start with a technical topic. I, I found uh, remote sensing, including satellite, aircraft, and the drone, plays important roles. And the GIS, geographic information system as well. How was this important in nuclear disaster, Takeo? All right, uh, thank you. Uh, for your question. Oh, yes, I agree. Uh, in the case of the Fukushima, for example, uh, satellite remote sensing was the only way to gather the information when the FDNPP action uh, prevented observation by aircraft and so on. And also, uh, since it's basically uh, repeatable, uh, it's possible to check the information later. Uh, by overlaying the information obtained by the remote sensing, with other information into the GIS, new knowledge uh, can be found. On the other hand, the, this disadvantage may be that the information you want to eat not always immediately available. Uh, this is uh, probably disadvantage of the satellite remote sensing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you also use uh, various techniques, technologies to monitor wildlife at a regional scale, right? Yeah, so we, we use um, in particular things like the, the motion activated cameras and the acoustic recorders that I mentioned earlier on. I mean, they, they, they have some real advantages for doing the kinds of, of studies that we may wish to do in exclusion zone locations. You, know, you, can, you can deploy these devices for long periods of time leave them capturing data as such there's a there's a minimal disturbance factor associated with their use they also capture data which you can analyze but somebody else can independently analyze as well so as long as data are then made openly available it means that we've got real opportunities for that independent scientific verification of research findings to take place the the motion activated cameras obviously capture larger things so we can get photographs of, of medium and large mammals for example 
the acoustic recorders fill in a gap there because they actually capture the sounds associated with all sorts of different wildlife. So we use them for studying birds and bird distributions. We can use them for understanding more about where bees are within particular areas and other insects. We can hear vocalizing amphibians. All of those things can be captured through these mechanisms. Obviously, one thing that this doesn't do is it doesn't allow us to really investigate physiological parameters and health status directly. So whilst we can see populations, we can see presence or absence of particular species, we aren't through these devices able to study things like changes in microbial communities within the gut. We're not able to study other physiological changes. So it's important that alongside the kinds of of research with these more remote sensing techniques, we also have these direct field research aspects too. And, you know, go beyond just looking at individual populations to looking at ecosystem functioning communities as a whole. Okay, thank you. And uh, Toshio, you are a landscape ecologist and also use GIS for Fukushima research as well. Yes. Um... GIS and remote sensing are useful for monitoring and modeling natural and anthropogenic factors around Fukushima and also for mapping ecosystem services and these services. And mapping can be the basis for zoning of a countryside landscape, as mentioned in Haruka's presentation. And the generated maps are also helpful to communicate between local residents and policy makers. So I think that is a very powerful potential in landscape ecology analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, move on to the next topic. Mike, you mentioned in your talk that Chernobyl and Fukushima provide natural laboratories. I agree. Uh, I agree. We can learn many things from uh, nuclear from the nuclear disasters uh, in my institute. Uh, Many scientists are working hard to understand how radionuclides migrate within forests and trees. But at the same time, these radionuclides are and would be used as traces to understand the material cycles in forests. This is really a natural regional scale laboratory. But apart from the radionuclides dynamics, in particular, as you mentioned, Chernobyl and Fukushima as a laboratories to land the impact of depopulation and removal, removal, removal of people. Right, Mike? Yeah, I mean, as you say, the, the, the radionuclide dynamics aspects, radionuclide transfer are things that we can readily study within the natural laboratories, but by no means are they the only things. You know, we, we, I think, can learn so much from using locations like Chernobyl and Fukushima to understand more about rates of vegetation succession, for example, after you remove human management pressure in particular areas, whether or not there's differences that we can discern as a result of different previous types of management. Something that, something that I'm quite interested in is the idea of ecosystem memory and the extent to which seed banks, et cetera, locked away within the soil can actually start to create regeneration of, of past landscape areas that we've had that maybe haven't materialized for extended periods as a result of these different management interventions that have taken place. So I think there's lots of opportunities to go beyond the classical radioecology, if you like, to learn more about ecology, ecosystem development, and ecosystem recovery in general. The other thing that I would mention as well is that we have within Chernobyl a system which is regularly perturbed by forest fire. And actually we can learn a lot from studying that system about the way in which fires not only affect things like radionuclide mobility, but also the way in which fires can perhaps be managed and 
in the forest managed in a way that helps to reduce fire risk and obviously that has then potential benefits from a, a wildlife perspective as well so really fascinating natural laboratories and i'd strongly encourage the international community as a whole to make maximum use of, of the opportunities that they provide mm. thanks Harka, uh, you are studying from human side. You are, for example, monitoring what happens when the population happens quickly. Well, um, for um, my opinion, uh, we have to be careful about using this term, uh, national laboratory. Uh, we should not use the term in the sense of using the victim or residents as test subjects. Rather, the experts like ourselves are being tested to see what they can do for the residents in the field. On the other hand, residents themselves have changed as a result of contamination and damage. They have been able to reflect on their past development and modern agriculture or forestry and realize that they need to live in more environmental conscious way. So uh, we need to listen to and learn from the changes in the consciousness of local people. All right. Okay, I, I think, okay. Uh, I think it, one keyword is perhaps uh, rewilding, re leave the area to nature. Uh, Takeo described the changes of land cover, and Mike described the changes in wildlife. Uh, I have heard that, uh, and you, you, you mentioned that Chernobyl areas are now like a natural sanctuary, nat nature reserve. Rewilding re re uh, sounds good, and I really like it because that means nature survives the radiation and the nature is recovering from human pressure. Personally, I believe it is one of realistic options for no-go areas. Uh, however, at the same time, Helka, I guess this uh, rewilding uh, may hinder the re return of local people and make the return of people's life difficult. Perhaps I, I should not mix up the no-go areas and the outside of no-go areas, uh, but uh, could you tell us your views? Uh, Please. Okay. Um, even in area, area uh, where the evacuation order has been lifted, the mountains are still highly contaminated, as I say. So uh, the uh, challenge is how to keep the forest maintain their function while limiting human access as much as possible. Over 150 years plan was inspired by Menjingu forest, where a widely variety of tree species were planted in the wilderness to create a forest with a high level biodiversity that could be naturally re renewed after 100 years. So the second forest uh, we used to use that had been used for uh, uh, for so far will be uh, converted into primary forest that will maintain their forest function and through national renewal without human intervention. We believe that planning a variety of tree species in the primary forest to increase diversity will also create an environmental where wildlife can live. Thanks. And how about in Chernobyl, Mike? Do people in Chernobyl accept uh, rewilding uh, favorably? I think certainly on the whole, it's accepted favorably. I mean, the, the designation of the biosphere reserve in Ukraine is, is a good indication of, of the national view of the, the importance of this area from the perspective of wildlife conservation and that rewilding process 
is something which is helping to sustain the development of the, the biosphere reserves um, ability to conserve and support biodiversity within that region. I, am, I think that in terms of the future planning and management, there's still lots to be learned about the way in which we can have a, a, a minimalist type intervention strategy with the environment so that we can promote biodiversity development in the least intrusive way possible. And again, when we're thinking about opportunities for, for learning from these environments, one of those areas is about how best to manage such a, a large and, and complex system for the benefit of a broad diversity of, of wildlife. Thanks, uh, Toshio. What, what do you think about this uh, from a landscape ecology viewpoint? For me, it is uh, very curious that abandoned landscape could be a tourism resource. Okay. Um, I, I also think it, it's interesting. However, maybe it might still be partly hard for the residents in motion in Fukushima and maybe it might take more years. However, I also suppose abandoned run landscape have potential as resources for education and tourism because the countryside landscape, countryside landscape has been generated by historical interactions between humans and nature. And that is essential for succeeding for the future generation. Yeah, that, so that is very, a good potential for uh, tourism and education. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, another key word would be communications. Haruka works in local communities and Mike as well. And Mike is putting effort into education. And uh, Takeo's maps uh, seem uh, to be a very powerful tool to communicate with uh, public people. Takeo, is this uh, correct? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, I think that, that the holistical mapping is more con convincing. And uh, also the uh, virtual reality that might be introduced is also a use of application to understand things, uh, applications. And uh, yeah, and the things are sort of more sensitive than two. I'm uh, personally uh, thinking about how it can be contributed to the benefit people and the environment in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hauka, uh, you, you are working in communities and have a lot of communications with local people. How important are communications with local communities? Okay, um, well, there are researchers who only obtain data without giving back to the residents and who impose their own opinions on the residents without engaging in discuss with them. So it's a, um, I, I have to uh, emphasize that um, it is the residents who are the main actor of the community. So it's a rule of researchers to to build trusting relationships with local residents and listen to their voices and discuss with them from the same perspective and help them realize their goals. Okay, Mike, uh, even 35 years have passed, even though 35 years has have passed, uh, communication and education must be even more important. I was impressed by the virtual reality headset, for example. Yeah, I mean, it, the, certainly the, the need for communication and education does not go away and, and potentially increases over time. I am one of the, the things that I, I actually started to notice when I began working in the exclusion zone was that there was a, a, a gap in people's knowledge, people in their late teens who actually, they weren't around at the time of the accident, they'd not really ever encountered much information about it because Chernobyl hadn't been promoted so much in the mainstream media for a while. And 
I was getting people asking me what Chernobyl was. And to me, that was just amazing. The idea that somebody wouldn't know about Chernobyl and the Chernobyl accident. So it was at that point that we started to really push ahead with doing the development of virtual Chernobyl. It's been extremely useful for communicating with publics around the world, but it's also been extremely useful actually for communication with local communities around the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Because it, strange as it may be for many people to think, you know, these are communities living, bordering the exclusion zone, but they never go in there. They don't actually know what it looks like inside that area that they're excluded from, which obviously then starts to create some degree of concern amongst some people as to, to what it's really like in there. So to give people this opportunity to explore different parts of the zone for themselves has been an extremely powerful thing. It's been great for, for helping with that community dialogue. It's been great for then helping with education within a school setting. And certainly if anybody wants to, I put the web link up before, I'll put it in the chat as well again. You know, go along to virtualchernobyl.com. I'm sorry, it's a really embryonic website at the minute, but it allows you to register to be able to just download a copy of a kind of three and a half minute trailer that's on there at the minute. And then you'll get notified as more of the resources get uploaded to that website when I've actually got some technical support to be able to do that. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, I we are now going into the end of the panel discussion. Today, I, I learned that uh, areas affected by the accident uh, are more or less recovering from the damage. I'm curious about the uh, future perspectives. Uh, first, uh, Takeo, what do you think? Well, yeah, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, I think uh, it's important to continue to monitor the situations and uh, to feedback the obtained information to local activities. Uh, in general, uh, people tend to uh, forget as time goes by, but uh, we are always there to watch over them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Helka, could you tell us your perspective? Tables. Uh, I guess there are both hopes and uh, continued difficult problems. Pa personally, I like your 150 years forest concept and project. It sounds a good way to coexist with the contaminated forests. Could you tell us your perspective? Okay. Um, the vision of our activity in Miyakoji is unconvenient. Uh, unconventional, unconventional, and that's I have to say. So, um, like the government's reconstruction policy timeline is too short, considering the lifespan of radiation, and tries to find a short-term technological solution. However, it doesn't restore the original livelihood of the area. And it's not the kind of recovery that residents want. And it's only a transit and superficial recovery, I, I think. So in construct to the government reconstruction policy, we are working to rebuild sustainable life over a long period of time with a awareness of half-life of radiation. So this is a grassroots activity. Um, there is no compensation or financial support from the government. Uh, even so, we would like to take time to discuss with the local people and expand our activities. And I would like to uh, you and the audience uh, to check our website, uh, which I put into my slides and please uh, expand uh, or uh, introduce other people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I will share some links uh, provided by the panelists later. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mike, Chernobyl is 25 years older than Fukushima. So must, be, must give hints to Fukushima. Yeah, I think that there's, 
there's certainly a lot of opportunities to learn from Chernobyl, um, especially in terms of things like the um, behavior and potential environmental impacts of, of radioactivity, um, including over multiple generations. So we can learn a lot for, from that scientific perspective. And as I've said more broadly, there's opportunities to learn about strategies for management of different areas, management for different priorities, be that ecotourism, conservation, um, mitigation of wildfires. There's, there's all sorts of different things that can be shared between the two locations. I think it's important to recognize that the priorities, the, the national priorities and indeed the local priorities for these two areas are different though. You know, we, within the Chernobyl situation, there perhaps isn't the driving need to reuse as much of that land as possible as there is within the, the Fukushima situation in Japan. And as a result of that, it's, it's not a one size fits all approach. We can't directly translate everything that's done in Chernobyl to Fukushima or vice versa. But again, I think we need to strongly encourage and build on the knowledge sharing between those two locations into the future. Thanks. And uh, Toshio, what will happen to the landscape in Fukushima? Hi. Um, I suppose there are several aspects of landscape changes in Fukushima. Firstly, the population and aging will accelerate in and around the area. And second, the underuse will accelerate the uh, increase in forest cover and also increase of old growth, for old growth forests in remote areas or relatively high radiation areas. Whereas there might be also increase in large scale development in the area where local people stop using. Third, wildlife will increase in the surrounding areas, which will expand the conflict between wildlife and resident. I suppose these aspects are dominant not only around Fukushima, but also in many areas in the countryside in Japan and probably worldwide. For analyzing these changes, mapping techniques and other various new tools are essential for monitoring and modeling both natural and social, cu social cultural aspects of landscape as presented in this webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, it's time to close uh, this webinar. Thank you, thank you everyone for being here today. And I also thank you all panelists for very interesting, insightful talks and discussion. Thank you, Takeo, Haruka, Mike, and Toshia. I also thank the committee members of the Landscape Ecology Unit of UFLO for this uh, collaboration and opportunity. I think that the webinar clearly illustrated the multi aspects of nuclear disasters and also that the problems are not independent, they are connected. So integrated transdisciplinary approaches are required. However, this is not only for nuclear disasters. Most problems like climate change, for example, need similar integrated approaches. So I would, be, I would be very happy if this webinar was a good opportunity to know the multi aspects of nuclear disasters, but also a good opportunity for you to provide new perspectives for your own research topics. Again, I thank you everyone for being here today. Now it is really a strange time caused by the virus. I, I hope you and your family stay healthy and we can meet face to face in the near future. See you next time. That's all from my side. Uh, I hand over to you, Toshia. Yes. Thank you, Shoji, for moderating our webinar. Thank you, Takeo, Haruka, and Mike for sharing very informative presentation and fruitful discussions. Finally, thank you for everybody for joining our webinar. Today, uh, the maximum participant number of participants is about 97 and still around 70, 70 excluding the panelists.
And this year, we are planning to have two other webinars in the Landscape Ecology Working Party. The next webinar will be held this June or July on the tentative topics of the United Nations Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, the Landscape Approach, hosted by Dr. Shed Ajijur Lauman Shifo, Center for International Forestry Research, Indonesia. He is a regional coordinator of South and Southeast Asia in the Landscape Ecology Working Party. Thank you very much for attending our webinar.